Conversation with Ron McLean. Welcome to In Conversation. Today on the show, one of the inductees of the class of 2021. I'll actually have Canada Sports Hall of Fame induction ceremony next year, of course, because of coronavirus. But Diane jones Konahowski is one of 11 named to the hall today. Congrats, Diane. And you'll hear from Diane in just a moment. Also on the show, Evan Dunphy, our great Canadian race walker. But first, a word about the Canada Sports Hall of Fame. As I mentioned, Diane, 45 years, she's given her life to sport. Uh, she was our chef de mission in 2000 at Sydney in Australia. Steve Nash played in those games and Steve is going into the Canada Sports Hall of Fame two-time NBA MVP Laurie Kane who won several times on the LPGA circuit two-time Canadian female athlete of the year Eric Lamaze and the late Hickstead are going in he won gold in Beijing in the individual show jumping in 2008 silver in the team uh, John Jackie Barrett who's a great lifter for Canada Sonia Godet who is a great uh, Paralympic curler three-time gold medalist they're the athletes going in also in the builders category, Willie O'Ree, Sheldon Kennedy, Judy Kent, a real advocate for anyone marginalized, be it the Indigenous uh, uh, athletes with disabilities. Judy was a powerhouse. Ross Paulus, great lacrosse player from Six Nations, and Duncan Campbell, who helped wheelchair rugby uh, gain uh, its popularity. So congrats to all the inductees. Quickly on Diane jones uh, I'll we'll get to hear her story, but... I think probably the neatest thing is a three-time Olympian. She won gold in Commonwealth's Pan Ams. She was 10th at uh, the Games in Munich in 72, 6th in Montreal, and then she was a medal favorite in Moscow, and we had a political boycott. So uh, it's quite a story, and she's given her life most recently to anybody suffering in any silo of trauma working with the Distress Center in Calgary. That's Diane. Evan Dunphy kind of fits perfectly with Diane in terms of humanism and uh, sportsmanship. You may recall at the Rio Olympic Games, uh, there was a racer from France. Johan Dinez was suffering stomach cramps, had to relieve himself mid-race, mid-course, fainted several times. And Evan uh, from Richmond, B.C. had his arm around him. Evan was already gold medalist in the 20K walk at Pan Ams in Toronto. Uh, and he would go on to win a bronze last year at the World Championships. Uh, so... Together, uh, they represent the very best of sports. Diane jones Konahowski, Evan Dunphy today, Hearts of Gold. Sport has transformed me into the person that I am today. There's Evan Dunphy, the best Canadian from Richmond. I define my success by how hard I work in the pursuit of my goals and my dreams. Evan Dunphy took the early lead. This is the biggest win of his career. Diane jones Konahowski made her dream come true in the pentathlon. What a special day for Edmonton and Diane jones Konahowski, the toast of a city that with certainty was alive with a full fever of the Commonwealth Games. And here they are, Evan and Diane. Diane, congratulations. Thank you, Ron. I'm yes. very honored and very surprised. Well, you can't be surprised, or you shouldn't be surprised is a better way to say it, because you've done so much and uh, you were so great in your time uh, uh, one of the things I guess I would just say, uh, you explain your uh, career now, how, how 45 years in sport and two decades with national teams and all those gold medals allows you now to work for the Distress Center in Calgary. I, I think that's an important, because Evan and you uh, strike me as humanitarians uh, and great athletes, but you first, Diane, on that. Well, you know, for me, Ron, I, I left the Olympic movement officially in 2010, just after Vancouver, and sort of entered into the sort of the real world. And I've always had a marketing, public relations, um, communications, fundraising background. So I've worked in a, a lot of different sectors. And this for me is the social sector. And it's really an interesting sector. And it's a good one for me because this will be my last job. Um, I'm, I'm older and it's a very compassionate workplace. So um, I love the people I work with. I'm surrounded by social workers so um, I can get um, lots of support and it's a great agency. We save lives every day. So for me, it's really about fundraising, trying to raise more money because all of our services are free. And then there's the communication piece, knowing, letting people know that we are available for them 24 seven. And Evan, one of the neat things for Diane is now she has the time, but when she was an Olympic athlete, like prior to Montreal in 1976, the pull at her uh, to be the poster person, to be a spokesperson uh, was incredible. She'd come back and forth from California to Canada and it probably was a sixth place because of that, right, Diane? Uh, yeah, right so, on, Ron. That's so right. Evan, you, you tell me how you're doing it because you your sportsmanship at Rio, why don't you tell the story first for the viewer, just in case they're not up to speed and then, and then we can morph into becoming, as you did, a star of documentary films in Japan because of what happened in Rio. 
So tell us what happened and, and how it's affected the way you kind of be a ambassador. Of course, yeah, and, and thanks for having me on. I mean, Rio, coming into Rio, I was nobody really. Um, not only in the Canadian landscape, but even in the in the race lock walking la landscape, I wasn't seen as someone who was a potential medalist really. There was maybe a few of us that thought, eh, hey, maybe we'll see what happens. But um, going into that 50K, um, it just, I had a good race the week before in the 20K, I thought I'm just gonna lay it all out there. I'm gonna just stick with the leaders and, and see how far I get. And if I collapse at 49K, cause I got nothing left. Well then so be it. That's, you know, that'll be success as long as I just, you know, leave the tank on empty. And so race progresses, 50K, a long way. Uh, we get to 45K. I'm in fourth place. I'm 18 seconds back at the athlete in third. And I was kind of feeling sorry for myself, being, oh, you know, fourth place, that's pretty good. But those guys are too far ahead. Fifth place is too far behind me. So I'll, I'll finish fourth. And hey, that's, you know, that's pretty cool. Uh, and then I click back in, being like, well, no, you said you were going to fight every step to stay with those leaders. What are you doing sitting here feeling sorry for yourself? Go catch these guys. And Put my put my feet down and or put my head down and looked at my feet and said, "Okay, just take one more step. Just take one more step. Just take one more step." And, and step after step, my body, um, you know, allowed me to to close that gap. And at 49 kilometers, I had closed that 18 second gap, um, three hours and 38 odd minutes into the race, beating Sun and Rio, struggling for that last four and a half minutes to the finish line. We I go to pass the third place athlete Hiroki Arai of Japan. He can't walk in a straight line. I can't walk in a straight line. We're absolutely exhausted. I go to pass him uh, way too close. He responds. We get our, our shoulders and, and elbows and everything tangled up. And, uh, and just that moment, just uh, my body just went, nah, we're done. This is the, you know, this, this gust of wind type uh, um, force that, that acted upon me was enough to just completely shut my legs down and, I can remember looking down at my legs, just begging them to to continue working and um, and get me to the finish line. And got to the finish line, fourth place, collapsed, Canadian record, best race I'd ever had. I was absolutely exhausted, but but overjoyed. And a couple hours after the race, they disqualified Hiroki uh, for for the incident, which made me the bronze medalist. I was the bronze medalist for about an hour, I guess, an hour or two hours. He appealed, as was his right, and um, his appeal was successful. I was, for lack of a better word, bumped back down to fourth place. We were then able to appeal once more, but having seen the video, having spoken to Hiroki, having known that nothing he had done was on purpose, not knowing whether we, I could have beaten him anyways in that final kilometer, there were just so many things um, that just made the right decision to, to walk away and, and be happy at fourth place. And um, yeah, it's a decision that I, I've been, um, you know, every day not knowing it was the right decision. So I'm happy with that. Well, there's a documentary in Japan about it. You're a hero there. You were a sportsmanship goes a long way, doesn't it, Diane? I mean, Lawrence Lemieux, uh, John Wood at your 76 Olympics. So it was great to uh, rogue off the Russian. He gave him some help when he had oil on his hands. And uh, Jamie Soleil and uh, David Pelche were great at Salt Lake. When you heard that story there just a moment ago, I'm sure it takes you right back into the arena. What's it like? Well, it does. And, and uh, just listening to it and knowing that you gave everything you had, uh, you, you were completely exhausted at the end and you did a personal best, a Canadian record. Really, at the end of the day, the first thing that I think athletes learn is you can break a Canadian record, you can do your best performance, and it won't get you to the podium. You know, so you do have to be very happy with, with the performance that you have. Absolutely. So. One of the things, uh, Evan, again, about Diane is not only is she, you know, multiple Pan Ams, Commonwealth gold medalist and uh, winning all over the place in multi-sport, which is her thing, like right after Moscow, we boycott uh, and Diane, you win uh, against all the people that competed in Moscow. Uh, you beat the Olympic champion, right? I beat them all, actually, but I think they were off their drugs because um, <laughs> <laughs> really, seriously, it was I was I was a drug free athlete and I've always advocated for drug free sport, as you know, Ron. And mm -hmm. and yeah, they um, I beat all the medalists from from Moscow in 1980, two weeks later, and their performances were um, really substandard. And that doesn't happen if you are a healthy athlete uh, two weeks after <laughs> a peak performance. So. Um, I knew all along that I was competing against druggies and yeah, you just hope for the best when you get to the, the big event, right? And Evan, that resonates for you, I know. <clears throat> yeah, I, I mean, I, I, you know, um, just going back to reading this morning about 
Um, I knew some of Diane's accomplishments on the track, but but reading more about what she's done off the track was just amazing to me. It's, it's the, the very much the same pathway that, that I hope to follow one day with um, work with kids sport and and and, and Chef de Michon and, and Sydney and all these things and um, you know, hit the nail on the head where you realize that you know you can have your best performance and finish off the podium. I growing up, I was the kid that only cared about winning. Medals were the only thing that mattered, and and sport um, slowly with great coaches and great mentors sort of taught me and, and helped me change that mentality a little bit. And so being in Rio and, and being able to walk away with my head held high without that medal, knowing I was still successful was, um, you know, a really powerful moment for me with sport and, and is one of the main reasons I want to give back in, in the community and get more kids involved in sport because it's changed my life. And I think it's changed others a lot, others lives. And, you know, the, hearing Dan talk about, um, competing against doped athletes and, 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 and all that stuff you're just like it's you know some things haven't changed but um you know those things maybe haven't changed in the negative but the things that haven't changed that are positive are the the power that sport has to um you know, unite people and, and change lives and i think we're we're both um uh, results of, of the amazing power that sport has well you're in richmond and over in coquitlam leah pell's fourth place 1500 meters atlanta 1996 is one of the greatest performances i've ever seen so I, i'll take those fourths anytime but that gets me in trouble actually diane you were a big part of our push to own the podium too so you, you maybe take it back to uh, lahid uh yugoslavia asking about albertans at the games remember is that what happened yes absolutely yeah he was apparently our premier at the time for alberta was in the opening ceremonies in sarajevo and he asked his um, team, you know, how many Albertans do we have on the Olympic team? And, and they said two. And he said, well, at my games, there will be more. So I was actually seconded from a high performance coaching situation in track and field in Saskatoon to head up an Alberta Olympic game plan in Alberta. So I moved to Calgary in 85, I believe. And uh, we had $4 million from the lottery. And our goal was to have one in five members of the Canadian team from Alberta. And wow, it was nice to have some money. It was nice to have that kind of goal. Um, our challenge at that time was that um, the majority of, of Albertans didn't know what the 10 Olympic sports were at that time. They knew about ski jumping because of Horace. They knew about figure skating and hockey, um, speed skating, but that's it. Uh, they didn't know about biathlon and luge and what's bobsleigh what's an art of combined <laughs> you know it was really an interesting time so we had some fun with it you know educating albertans and and also putting money into sports so we could hire coaches and we could hire technical people and we could go and recruit athletes and anybody who was breathing and warm and upright um, on the streets of Calgary, we'd bring them in. Come on, you want to be a loser? You want to do bobsleigh? It was so much fun. So, um, yeah, that those were the that was a really really good time for me, and that's how I kind of got into the um, more administrative part of coach of um, sport, mm -hmm. getting away from summer and getting into the winter and, and broadening my horizons and realizing realizing that all athletes doesn't matter what sport you come from, you all need the same thing. It's funny, uh, 2004 Athens, uh, well, first of all, 2002 Salt Lake, right after your mission chef in Sydney, uh, we have seven Red Deerians at the Salt Lake Games, seven from Red Deer. And then you've yeah. got Athens, you had uh, David Ford, fourth Olympics from Edmonton, uh, Susan Natras from Edmonton, sixth Olympics, uh, just a bunch of uh, Albertans now dominating. Now over on your side, Evan, you're moving on up. So you're fourth in Rio, uh, now at Doha last year, you're on the podium. And back again to the, the role of your team, you were really good to speak about uh, the forerunners, the people that inspired you and your coach. So tell the viewer about that. Yeah, um, you know, coming after, so going into Rio, you know, unknown, have this amazing result and fourth place. Okay, well, the next obvious step, podium. That's that's kind of, you know, how what's ingrained into you. Okay, you're up there at the world, you know, top in the world. Now you got to finish on the podium. 2017, 18 went into my world championships thinking, all right, I gotta, I gotta be on the podium. That's what has to happen. And just having disastrous races. And um, you know, 2019 was really just a step back to what brought me success in 2016, which was focusing on the process, um, you know, going in and, and racing my race and just seeing what comes out of it. And um, that ability to do that, that, that mentality, you know, I have so many people to thank for that, but um, you know, First and foremost, my coach, Jerry Dragomir, I've been working with him since I was 10 years old. He's the only race walking coach I've ever had. He was um, yeah, my first ever race as a 10 year old. I, I 
went because my brother was good at race walking and I thought, well, if he could do it, it must be easy. And um, I, I went and did this race and this guy came up to me after and said, hey, you look like you enjoyed that. Do you want some help learning how to do it properly? And I said, yep. And, and you know, we're, we still work together and he, he's gone on now to win Canadian coaching awards and, and, and all this different stuff. And it's just been an amazing journey with him. And um, you know, I, I'm also very lucky to have the best sports science team in my opinion, in the world behind me. And I love that stuff, my background in sports science. So I know I'm not the most physiologically, genetically gifted athlete on that start line, but I, I go into these races with so much confidence knowing that I can do all those little things right, uh, especially in Doha where it was just conditions like you've never seen before. I mean, none of us had ever competed in anything like this. We were competing 11.30 at night and it was still 30 degrees and 78% humidity. And um, it was, and I stood on that start line confident knowing that that I was prepared for those conditions because I've you know physiologists like Trent Stillingworth um that prepared me for it and and, and it was just you know I'm, I'm so lucky for that and it is you know track and field an individual sport but I can attest to the fact that you have an entire army behind you that, that helps you get there I like your joke that uh, your UBC rec league hockey games prepared you to be on playing at one in the morning <laughs> is that true about how good a hockey player are you <laughs> Oh, um, you know, that's that not very good at all, but um, I love it. I, You're an athlete. I, made, I made a deal with my coach um, back in high school. Uh, I said, look, if I'm going to keep race walking, I got to be able to play hockey because I had a lot of aggression as a teenager and, and race walking is not the, uh, the, the best way to, uh, to, to get rid of it. Um, and I still love playing. And, and you know, yeah, we, we, ice time was expensive. So you'd have games that would start it. At, at midnight and I remember I was playing for one of the frats it was our championship game and uh I was in my first year of university so 18 years old and we step out there at midnight or whatever it was and there's this there's this old guy behind the net and all all the other frat guys are going oh who the hell's this guy and, and I had to kind of go oh yeah that's, that's my dad he came out to support me <laughs> he had driven out to uh to UBC at midnight to to watch my rec rate rec hockey league championship game and I think that just goes to to show you know the family support that I've had um, over the years in my career, like, you know, my, my parents have been just the biggest rock ever and, and my biggest supporters. So, um, you know, it's a fun little story, but it also shows ju just how, you know, how supportive they are. Uh, Diane, why don't you tell your story about, cause just hearing that focus thing uh, coming back in 2019 for Evan, uh, tell, tell us what it was like for you going into the Montreal Olympic games with all the back and forth from California and, and just how you kind of learned uh, to give of yourself the right way when you came to Edmonton for the 78 Commonwealth Games as kind of the marquee person. Yeah, good for you, Ron. You, you know that story. Uh, yeah, we had moved down to Santa Barbara, California. There was a group of us, Thelma Wright, Lionel Pugh, my coach. We moved down there to train for the winter because as Ron said, um, there's a lot of pressure for us in those days. There weren't that many medal contenders in the 70s. So for us to host the games in 76. So we went down, we, we had a wonderful training situation at Santa Barbara, but uh, I was chosen the um, coin poster girl along with uh, the Postmaster General of Canada, Andre Ulac. Um, I was invited to Toronto every second weekend to promote the games and, and I did. I was, you're right, I was um, back in Canada every two weeks and by the time I got to Montreal, um, I just knew. I just knew that I'd given so much of my time and of myself before the games that I didn't have a lot left. And it was so frustrating because I could have got a medal. I could have got a medal at those games. Huge learning, um, huge lesson in life I learned for sure. So going into 78 Commonwealth Games, another scenario, hometown, Canadian um, medal favorite. Um, yeah, and I just shut myself down. I just was very, very careful around uh, the media and giving of myself and ended up to have a, a wonderful day, um, perfect weather. I was chosen to run the message into the opening ceremonies and give it to the queen. The queen opened the games. She was to give the first medal of the games, which was the one that I won, which was awesome. And it was just a perfect story and my score landed me number one in the world which was great and so that was a huge confirmation that uh, yes I was a medal contender in 1980 so still didn't trust myself around Moscow we moved to New Zealand for the winter you know my my coach and his family moved took their kids out of school we went down and we trained and um, 
April 23rd, we heard we were boycotting. So, hmm. yeah, that's yeah. that's a tough one. That's a real uh -huh. tough one. Uh, you have a, a, a majesty or a queen. We lost her now, Nona, but uh, we were grateful to tell the story of your grandmother, Evan, at, at the Rio Olympic Games. Tell tell the viewer about her role as a mentor in your family's life and uh, and then maybe kind of move us into uh, just you know, that kind of leadership that you, you felt from her. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, Nana, um, you know, a little bit more prepared for this in, in Rio, you, you caught me off guard in our conversation with this and, and, uh, and ended up, uh, uh crying on national television, which, uh, I hadn't anticipated doing <laughs> earlier that night. Um, no, Nana was, uh, just this bedrock of support in our family. Um, you know, just, any little thing someone did, it was blown up to be this amazing achievement because she literally was that excited for you. And, uh, and sport was her thing. Um, you know, after she passed a couple of years ago, hearing stories, um, of, you know, that I'd never heard before of, of her holding, um, you know, little cousin watching a football game, or I think it was a rugby, rugby, game, rugby match. And they're running for a try. And she was all of a sudden on the ground, crawling, holding, Holding, holding little little baby as if she was the rugby ball running with the team like she just would get so into it and and you know so I grew up around that passion for sport and um and, and just I think that was just infectious I think so everyone in my family now seems to work in some realm related to um to sport whether it's directly as as an athlete like me or um you know in the background <laughs> Yeah, your brother Andy should mention. Amazing on this series, we've had Connor McDavid as an older brother, Mitch Marner, an older brother, and that's it. No other siblings. Brett Kissel, an older brother, and no other siblings. And so their compete gene comes from that. And you've got Andy. Adam. Adam, yeah. Adam, uh, sorry, Adam. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and and again, you know, he um he went into into broadcasting. You know, he's you're 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 one of his uh his heroes and role models. And um just that that sports gene, it it never went too far away. Everyone's got um, tentacles somewhere in the sport world now. And I think a, a lot of that, if not all of it, is just from the passion that Nana had. Diane, this is Bill Hunter. You know who he is. <laughs> this is yeah. going to have to be Wayne Gretzky <laughs> writes the forward. So that's Wild enough. Wild Bill from Saskatoon. <laughs> so here's what he wrote in his uh, memoir. Near our house lived the Griffiths family. I knew Mr. Griffiths as the father of my friend, Bob. He was also head of athletics at the University of Saskatchewan. Griffith Stadium, University of Saskatchewan, where the Huskies play, is named for him. When I was about seven, Joe Griffiths began showing up in our neighborhood with a gifted young athlete named Ethel Catherwood. Watching Ethel was something of a revelation to us. Sure, we played hockey and ball and ran races, but we were just fooling around having fun. Ethel's discipline and rigorous approach was different. My friends and I would uh, talk over uh, about Ethel's training sessions, and we gathered up her stuff. She did javelin and discus. And she was like you, multi-sport, right? And came back from Amsterdam with a gold medal. Um, you followed in her footsteps. Saskatoon, every young woman growing up in sport in Saskatoon, you mentioned your high-performance uh, multi-sport uh, initiative that you had for a while there. That has to make you feel very good. And John, too. You're John, John Konahowski, uh, <laughs> the role in Saskatoon. Well, Griffith Stadium was my home. Yeah. started on a, um, no, it wasn't a dirt track, it was a cinder track, and that's what I trained on for well, 20 years. Uh, we competed there, we, we uh, it's going to be torn down, I think this is the last summer it's going to actually exist, and it'll move somewhere else in the city of Saskatoon, so um, yeah, that was my training ground, so um, yeah, fond memories for sure. I think that's with your Canada Sports Hall of Fame induction too, you know, you're kind of following in the footsteps, and uh, you set such a path for for that. So Evan, Tokyo, uh, obviously like uh, Diane's induction is going to be pushed off to 21. What has it meant to you? How are you dealing with that? Yeah. I, I mean, the whole thing, it's now that we've had a couple months to, to process it and, uh, and come to terms with everything. I mean, when it, when it hit, it hit like a, um, a tornado. It was just sort of everything moving so quickly and uh, the immense amount of pride that I felt in, in being Canadian um, in, in the role that Canada played in that decision. And, and the Canadian Olympic Committee coming out and saying, "Oh, we're not going to, we're not going to send our athletes that have the and and you know, it's a feeling that I'm sure um, resonates very strongly with, with Diane. But um, it was this, it was this weird, weird sense of okay, well, the Olympics aren't aren't happening for Canada, but they might still be happening for everyone else. And and there wasn't a, sh a, a shred of sadness in that. There was this extreme pride of 
hey, that like it, it, it brought Canadians even more together, I felt. Um, and then obviously a couple of days later, the IOC went and made the decision to postpone it. So, um, you know, now it's just about training for, for 2021 and, and shifting our, our goals a little bit. And, you know, hopefully we'll still have the, 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 the games go off without a hitch um, next year. That's not guaranteed, um, but we're, you know, I, my training went really well. I'm, I'm really happy with where I'm at. And um, I'm just trying to find positive ways to frame it and say, okay, an extra year, that's going to benefit me. Uh, I'm in my mind, at least still on the up and up in my career. And some of my biggest competitors are trying to hold their peak. So frame that as an advantage for me and, and just try to find different ways that I can, you know, take the positivity out of this difficult situation. One thing, Evan, uh, that Diane just mentioned that for uh, Moscow, she trained at New Zealand to kind of keep herself <laughs> safe distancing from <laughs> the temptation of corporate Canada. Um, you have trained a lot in Australia. Adam Van Coeverden was on the series and he mentioned going down and training with Marcus and Heinrich, two Swedes. And he had, of course, Tim Brabens, who's a great Australian uh, paddler. Uh, it's a neat community, right? How you, you are tribals, but you, you go and train together. Explain that a little bit to us. Yeah, it's absolutely amazing. We, I go down to Australia every, every winter, um, you know, from Vancouver, but even, even Vancouver's winters are a little bit too harsh for me. I'll take an Australian summer any day. And, uh, and we, we gather, there's, you know, 15, 20, 25 of us from a dozen different countries that come together to train together. And I, I think that's, again, it just goes to show the power of sport. We're all competing against each other you know, at these competitions, but we can, we can all push each other to be our best um, in the meantime. And, it's you know definitely the most special um, moments I've had in my in my career being able to train with these guys and um, you know at the World Championship in Doha standing on the sidelines losing my mind cheering for my teammate who came across to win win bronze in the 20k who's an athlete from Sweden you know it and it, it meant just as much to me to see him succeed as it would to see another Canadian teammate succeed so it's such a close tight knit community and and um, what I think I'm most grateful for, uh, I was best man at, at, um, at my best friend's wedding in January down in Australia. Um, you know, just these, these friendships that you make over the years last a lifetime, whereas my, my sporting career will come to an end, but those friendships, you know, those will last. And, you know, I have, I have couches to sleep on all over the world, which is really, really nice. Who, who is that that you served as best man? Uh, Brendan Reading. So he was, uh, he competed in, in Rio in the 50k as well. And we spent pretty much all of 2016 training together. He, I went to Australia, he came to Vancouver, we went to Flagstaff and Arizona together, we went to, to Europe to train together. It was just an amazing, you know, you get, get to hang out with your best friend and, and also be training for the Olympics at the same time. It's, you know, not many people can do that. So Diane, you pick up on that. And then, and then after you maybe share a little bit about your, you know, respect among your colleagues in multi-sport, because it's really huge in that particular discipline. Uh, being a mission chef in Australia, is, um, it was an amazing Olympics. Kathy Freeman, I'll never forget. Your, your friends in the business uh, in sport and then what it was like to be the chef de mission in tw 2000. Well, I was uh, a member of the uh, sorry, uh, Canadian Olympic Committee at that time. I think I sat on that committee board of directors for about 18 years, but to be selected, obviously, is a huge honor. Um, <clears throat> Sydney was uh, a wonderful opportunity. And for me, it was full circle, Ron, because my first Olympics was 72. And uh, just to sort of know that uh, I had come full circle. And it was at a time in the 90s when the uh, Canadian Olympic Committee was starting to reach out to athletes and involve them on mission staff. And I believe it was the president of the time, Bill Warren, that wanted to see more athletes on the mission staff. So I worked, um, I worked at Lilyhammer in, in 94 and uh, Lori Graham was on there, uh, Michael Slipchuk. For the first time ever, they had four or five Olympians on the mission staff, uh, which was a really smart thing to do because there's no one better to know what needs to happen in an Olympic village or around uh, organizing a mission um, uh, situation than the athletes themselves. So from then on, we've just continued to involve athletes, which is really great. And we've got them at the table, which is why the Canadian Olympic Committee is so successful in creating, I think, probably the best mission situation in Olympic Village. We are very concerned about where we are as it relates to the dining hall, the transportation hub. You know, we want to make sure we're not by rowdy countries. And there's a lot of thought given by the team that works on behalf of the athletes. 
and the coaches, which is the real team, right? There's another team of medical experts and administrative experts and sport experts that are trying to create the best situation possible. So to be a part of that and to learn all about that um, was really valuable for me. And it gave me a whole new appreciation because sometimes athletes are quick to criticize an organization, but until you really get involved and you are a part of the decision-making, you don't realize how difficult it is. But at the end of the day, it's about what's best for the athlete. What was your highlight in 2000, Sydney? Oh, 2000, Sydney. Um, gosh, there, there were so many. But you know what? I think it's the opening ceremonies and uh, a fellow inductee, um, Steve Nash, of course, was on the team. And I saw him sort of separate himself from the team and just sort of stand there looking out. I mean, there's nothing like an Olympic opening ceremony. There's nothing in the world mm -hmm. that matches that. And I just kind of went over to him and I said, pretty cool, hey. And um, it was just neat to sort of stand there. And he was taller than I thought. He looked pretty short on the, on the court compared to the guys 7'6 right. and 7'8. He was yeah. quite tall. Um, but it was just sort of a moment. I thought, here's a professional athlete that maybe gets it you know, that, that kind of gets it, this, the uniqueness of this and the real specialness of the Olympic movements. And um, that, was, that was sort of one that stands out right now for me. But uh, the whole experience was, was absolutely amazing. Me too. Steve, Steve, the interview he gave after Canada bowed out in basketball, uh, we closed the Sydney coverage with that interview. He, he was so heartfelt and so uh, such a great ambassador for the spirit of Olympism. Well, listen, Diane, congratulations on the hall. Uh, I can't say enough about what you do for us as Canadians and as athletes. And Evan, you too, uh, what you did for kids sport there, 25K a day for 25, just amazing. And congratulations uh, to both of you on your exploits. Continued good luck. Huge thanks to Diane and Evan. Coming up Friday, 7 o'clock Eastern, 4 Pacific, we're back with Harner Ryan Singh, who didn't really like the Pittsburgh Penguins, and now he's revered in Pittsburgh. It's a funny story from his new book. He and Nick Bonino will be on the show. As always, we'll close with a song lyric. Here's one for Evan. He got the action. He got the motion. Yeah, the boy can play. You do the walk. You do the walk of life. Mark Knopfler and Dire Straits. For all of us, thanks for watching. So long for now.